Welcome to this MNI webcast. I'm Luke Hyten, Senior ECB Correspondent at MNI, and we thank all of you for joining us today, including those of you who are clients of MNI. We take a great deal of pride in our coverage of critical central bank and other macroeconomic trends and developments for global financial markets. And we're honoured to welcome Philip Lane, Chief Economist and Executive Board Member of the European Central Bank, to our forum to discuss developments in the Eurozone economy and ECB monetary policy. He joins us at a time when the global economy is striving to free itself from the shackles of the pandemic, and most central banks, including the ECB, are confronted with rising inflation pressures. But how persistent are they? Complicating the outlook are surging energy costs and heightened geopolitical tensions, combining to make the job of the central bank policy policymaker an extremely challenging one. We very much look forward to hearing Philip's thoughts and perspectives as one of the world's foremost economists. Philip became ECB Chief Economist in June 2019, after five years as Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, and a long academic career, principally at Trinity College Dublin, where he was Professor of International Macroeconomics. He took his doctorate at Harvard, and has been a visiting scholar at the IMF and New York Fed, as well as consultant at the European Commission, the World Bank, Asia Development Bank, and other multinational institutions. Thank you again, Philip, for joining us today. This MNI webcast is fully on the record, our speaker will make some scene-setting remarks for 15 minutes or so, and has kindly brought along some slides to illustrate them. I'll then raise questions we've collated, some of them submitted by participants joining us today. We also invite you to raise questions as we go along by submitting them via the chat box. We're monitoring this and can raise some of the pertinent entries. This MNI webcast is scheduled to run for up to, but not beyond one and a half hours in total. So I'll swiftly hand over to our speaker, Philip Lane. Philip. Okay, th thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning uh, for those of you uh, uh, in America. So let me start off with some uh, brief opening remarks, and uh, you can find these on the ECB website. And uh, essentially, my, my goal today is to differentiate between uh, near-term and medium-term inflation dynamics. So in relation to the near-term, I, you know, in a blog post last week, I emphasized that what we see right now uh, I interpret as largely shaped by a pandemic cycle that has generated global bottlenecks for manufactured goods over the last year. And uh, most importantly for the year area, has seen a very substantial surge in energy prices in, in recent uh, weeks and months. Now, of course, the surge in energy prices has implications both in the near term and the me medium term. Uh, and we can really think of four different uh, mechanisms. So first, most obviously, there's a direct impact to the energy component of the price index. Um, uh, because since energy is an important input for many, many other components of the price index, including uh, food, transportation, goods, and actually many consumer services as well have energy as an important input. Third, uh, uh, we can think about a, a, a dynamic uh, effect on wages, where, of course, in, in terms of that second round mechanism, it's important to have due differentiation between a one-off or catch-up wage adjustment to the extent that uh, the energy uh, price effect is a mostly a level effect versus a revision in inflation expectations that would have more uh, longer run persistent impacts on wage dynamics. And then fourth, uh, we, we have to think about the general equilibrium and uh, the macro impact because high energy prices have negative uh, income and wealth effects for an energy importer like the uh, euro area. Uh, and of course, uh, in terms of in response to that price signal, energy sensitive production and investment plans will also be revised. So as I just indicated, uh, globally, when we look at the increase in energy prices, uh, the macroeconomics will look different between energy producing and energy using uh, regions. And for net importers such as your area, uh, you know, any modeling should take into account that this is a significant adverse terms of trade shock. Uh, higher import prices for energy reduces the disposable incomes of households and the cash flows of energy intensive firms. And uh, tracing out the impact of this terms of trade shock on the year area will be you know, a major task in the, in the coming uh, quarters. Okay, so I uh, suppose that's, that's my quick uh, summary of the, of the near-term uh, situation 
and again, I went into more detail uh, last week. Okay, so uh, moving from the near term to the medium term, uh, I've already signaled that there's a potential linkage uh, between these two, uh, which is essentially if the currently high inflation causes a, a reassessment about the likely level of medium term inflation, uh, whereby a persistent shift in inflation expectations can play a significant role in determining inflation dynamics. So there are several mechanisms that, that might be at work. First of all, at any given time, the recent history of inflation is an important input in shaping the beliefs of households, uh, firms and investors. Before the pandemic, there were widespread concerns that a long period of below target inflation in the year area had led to a downside to the anchoring of inflation expectations. In particular, there was a widely held conjecture that myriad structural forces uh, interacting with the effective lower bound for monetary policy would keep inflationary pressures low for an extended period with persistent monetary accommodation only gradually returning inflation to the 2% target. The currently high uh, inflation rate calls into question this conjecture through a sharp demonstration, stark demonstration that inflation is not destined to be always super low. Now, uh, in principle, uh, we, we can understand that argument, but precisely how much medium term inflation expectations might be affected by the current burst of inflation will depend on the intensity and the duration of this spell of above target inflation, the nature of its underlying driving forces, in particular, the balance between external supply shocks versus domestic demand shocks, and of course, the extent to which the central bank is trusted to, del to deliver the 2% target over the medium term. So uh, in relation to the uh, role of the central bank, it's important that the central bank is understood to be symmetric in its commitment to the 2% target. Being fully prepared to act, react proportionately if there is a, a threat that inflation will settle above 2% in the, in the medium term, while also making sure not to overreact to the extent that, it, that there is a risk that high near-term inflation might induce an excessive monetary tightening that pushes inflation persistently below the 2% target over the medium term. So, so that is the uh, balancing act uh, we, we face. Now, I think this discussion uh, needs to take into account is that uh, over the last year, so well before the, the energy shock, medium-term inflation expectations have been increasing from a low base. Uh, towards the 2% target. And uh, it's worthwhile to think about the, the specific context of the euro area, that there are several factors that suggest that the excessively low inflation, the well below target inflation environment that did prevail uh, before the pandemic. And for example, over 2014 to 2019, the inflation rate just averaged 0.9%. Uh, so more than a full percentage point below the target. But as I say, there are several indicators indicating that this regime may not, may not reemerge even after the pandemic cycle is over. First, this uh, reason to think about this is the scale of the fiscal and the monetary re response to the pandemic demonstrated the strength of the commitment to delivering macro financial stability rather than seeing a return to the pre-pandemic dynamics that did act as a powerful anti-inflationary force after the twin crises of the global financial crisis and the euro area sovereign debt crisis. Uh, and on this occasion, this has included substantial policy action at both EU and national levels, with the EU level including the SURE programme, extra funding for the European Investment Bank, and most significantly, the Next Generation EU Initiative. And in particular, and again in contrast to the twin crisis episode, the medium-term nature of the Next Generation EU programme has provided an, an important anchor for medium-term economic prospects, especially for the main beneficiary countries. At the national level, we have witnessed the deployment of large-scale government interventions 
to buffer the impact of the pandemic shock on household and corporate incomes through uh, all of the programs we know about, temporary employment protection, uh, schemes and tax cuts, uh, and of course, the role of public loan guarantees to facilitate the normal financing of economic activity. All of this stands in contrast to the macro configuration that characterized the period after the twin crises, where we saw very muted aggregate de demand dynamics, uh, which of course, in turn, can be explained by so many governments, households, firms and banks focused on sustained deleveraging uh, after the period of excessive imbalances. So, th so that's factor number one. Factor number two is, is uh, the re-anchoring of medium-term inflation expectations towards 2%. Uh, has been supported by the clarity of our new monetary policy strategy, uh, which was finalized in July, and which was you know, converted into, into a concrete policy action in terms of our revised interest rate forward guidance. So the revised strategy makes it crystal clear that the monetary policy of the ECB is dedicated to delivering the 2% target over the medium term, with a symmetric aversion to below target and above target deviations. So the simplicity and transparency of the 2% target increases accountability and improves clarity compared to the previous target of below but close to 2%. Third, uh, in relation to structural forces, some revisions to beliefs about the operation of the world economy uh, might also be contributing to a shift in inflation expectations. Uh, in particular, some cite the level of excess capacity in global manufacturing might be structurally diminishing to the extent that China has embarked on a transition from an export-led to a domestically focused economy. In related uh, manner, rising wages and incomes in emerging economies mean that uh, globalization might more operate through demand-side factors than supply-side factors in the coming years. Uh, another structural force is the increasing visibility of aging dynamics in some Western economies, which is also, of course, becoming visible in some emerging areas, including China, uh, which may result in a less dynamic labor supply at the global level. Now, the net impact of the demographic change on inflation dynamics is not straightforward. While a lower labor supply may potentially have a direct impact on labor costs, it could also have adverse implications for the potential growth rate of the world economy. And furthermore, of course, uh, the net impact on labor supply in any given region will also depend on international migration policies that can either amplify or mitigate regional balances in labor supply. Let me also point out in terms of those uh, thinking about how structural forces might change the medium term at, uh, inflation uh, uh, dynamic is that the pandemic may also have accelerated plausibly the digitalization of the world economy which could operate as an anti-inflationary force by increasing national and international competition, including in previously sheltered services sectors. And maybe in terms of the collection of structural forces um, to think about it is we also need to think about the carbon transi tra transition, which, will, which is set to be a primary contributor to macro dynamics uh, in this de decade, given all of the 2030 targets and the decades to come. Now, the net impact, again, is on inflation dynamics will depend on the exact transition path that emerges and the time horizon that we're talking about. In particular, the mechanical impact of the transition on energy prices, and of course, in terms of uh, uh, retail energy prices, uh, even that mechanical impact will depend on the evolving mix between fossil fuels and renewables and energy production. We'll have to be assessed jointly with the implications of a sustained phase of transition-focused corporate, household, and public investment. In particular, the impact on inflation dynamics must take into account the shift in the composition of economic activity between investment and consumption, and the wealth effects of the transition on the value of carbon-intensive assets, including housing. And of course, uh, moving towards a longer horizon perspective, uh, massive investment in renewable technologies should deliver sizable efficiency gains into production and use of energy over time, reducing overall expenditure on energy, even of course, if that horizon is quite uncertain. But of course, uh, when we think about all of this, uh, we, we, I think uh, 
uh, received wisdom is that an orderly transition will have a more benign and milder macro impact than a deferred process that requires sharper adjustment at a later stage. Okay, so uh, what I've said here is uh, an important force shaping medium term inflation dynamics it is the evolution of inflation expectations and the fact that it may not be going back to the pre-pandemic level. So now uh, in, in the charts, I just want to illustrate that in a different, number of different ways. Okay, so the, the first one uh, is essentially fairly uh, uh, high frequency and I, I use um, consensus economics for this. And uh, what you see here um, is if you like the uh, yellow line and, and the yellow uh, uh, uncertainty range, which is from last August, had inflation uh, picking up in 2021, but then fading back down to well below 2% this year in 22 and thereafter. So consensus economics uh, really just uh, six months ago had a vision where there was a, you know, obviously already a pickup in inflation in 2021, uh, but it would fade. Now, whether we take the January or the, uh, the set, well, the January consensus in terms of uh, the timeline, the most likely outcome is quite similar actually to the year system staff projections from December, which basically had revised upwards. Uh, but 2021 had seen a new peak in 2022, uh, but still have a narrative where essentially uh, that this is temporary and the inflation will fade th this year. Um, and uh, in, in those uh, uh, projections from the ECB staff in, in uh, December, but also, uh, you know, in terms of the, the most likely path under the consensus, would come back a nudge below 2% uh, next year. So uh, the first point to make is to make this sharp distinction between uh, the temporary component and the vision for the, for the medium term. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so, so now uh, what I want to show is, is the evolution uh, just over the course of the pandemic. And uh, here we're taking a range of different measures. So whether it's consensus economics, Eurozone barometer, the survey of professional forecasters, the survey of monetary analysts, or the darker green line being the weighted average of the surveys, is uh, if you think about the history of the pandemic, well, starting off, uh, these longer term expectations were kind of uh, well below 2%. The first thing that impacted the pandemic, which of course we were very concerned about, is that the pandemic might have significant adverse medium term effects. So, you know, in the uh, middle of 2020, uh, 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 depending on what you look at, uh, that there was some uh, downgrade in these medium term uh, prospects. Um, but what you've seen essentially since the start of 21, across all of these measures, is uh, repeated revisions up. You've had a cumulative uh, significant move over the course of the last year. So again, well before the energy shock, uh, which is essentially uh, bringing uh, the, the world of uh, those who uh, fill out these surveys much closer to 2%. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's been a significant uh, move. Uh, the third chart, please. And uh, again, uh, there I was looking at kind of the averages. Here's the distribution from our own survey of monetary analysts, where I, I, I uh, report what we see now in the, in the start of 22 versus what we see in the start of 21. So all of the ECB watchers who fill out these forms have also uh, moved uh, the distribution um, to the right. Although, of course, there's still a significant, you know, there's definitely. Uh, still plenty who think uh, inflation will settle uh, below 2%, uh, but the most popular answer in the survey is now 2%. Uh, but regardless of whether you focus on the, on the modal value or the whole distribution, there's a clear shift to the right in this distribution. Uh, next chart, please. Um, and then a, a, another way to capture this is asking, uh, you know, what fraction uh, of the... Uh, those who fill out the survey, uh, uh, where do you think uh, inflation will settle uh, in the medium term? 
And what's important to emphasize here is uh, if you start back at the start in the pre-pandemic, 90% of the uh, survey uh, respondents felt that in the long term, we would settle below 2%. So a very strong collective sentiment that in the, the, there remained an open-ended long-term challenge uh, for the ECB. Um, now, uh, if, if I run an econometric test, it might suggest there's some uh, movement around the time of our strategy review announcement, which confirmed our 2% target. But regardless of the causal factor, let me just focus now on the fact that Yes, it's still the case. Half the survey thinks we will settle below 2%. Um, but now nearly 40% of the survey think we will uh, achieve the 2% target. And maybe what's important is it remains pretty, pretty much constant. So that only about 10% of the respondents think we face, we face an above target uh, medium term outlook. Okay, uh, next chart. Uh, we also survey consumers. Uh, this is our uh, uh, survey, uh, consumer expectation survey, which is proving uh, very handy, which we do every month. And the, the points to notice here are, and again, this is showing the evolution uh, during the course of the pandemic. Um, and also for reference, I show the evolution of actual headline inflation. It is that there is a clear uh, uh, awareness of near-term inflation. So the response about you know one year ahead inflation uh, has been picking up over, over this uh, these recent months, but in terms of the three year ahead inflation, consumers also agree by and large that what we're seeing is essentially uh, transitory in nature. Next slide. Uh, now, of course, uh, we also look at market based measures, not just survey measures. And uh, what you see here is uh, before the pandemic, you know, um, the five-year five-year, for example, was in the, in the, you know, the, you know, around one two five, uh, that kind of number. It, it plunged um, it, at the start of the pandemic, and then it's been uh, steadily uh, increasing over time. So that, again, that, that's a pretty big uh, movement in the five-year five-year. Now, uh, we also, and I mentioned it in the written text, uh, we also have to think about the fact that it's been slipping in, in recent weeks. And of course, I'll enter the usual proviso that these measures of inflation compensation are some mix of the true expectation uh, and risk premium. Um, so of course, I'm, I'm including this as an important uh, indicator without trying to be too literal about it. Okay, next chart. Um, and then maybe uh, the uh, it's worthwhile also thinking about uh, over this period, you know, post crises, uh, the evolution of, of inflation. And uh, what I included here uh, in in terms of the yellow dots is that at any point in time, what was the end of horizon um, uh, projection of the year system staff? Um, and essentially, the the point here is. Uh, of course, the end of horizon projection is, is going to be a lot more stable than the data, because of course the end of horizon uh, projection will take into account you know the ECB will respond uh, when there's a uh, threat to, to the at two percent target. But maybe what I want to focus on here is again at the start of the pandemic, in the start of 2020, and uh, there was a significant downgrade in terms of our projection horizon vision for inflation. We did feel. Uh, the staff did feel, and I would have agreed, uh, that there was a, a significant uh, a negative shock of the pandemic on the projected inflation path. Um, so you, you see that, you know, it dipped to, to around 1.3. Uh, but what we've seen uh, in the last year, uh, and especially uh, going from September to December, a significant pickup in the end of horizon uh, projection. So, so the, uh, the, the kind of uh, models we look at, the overall assessment, uh, has basically seen this uh, ebb and flow, uh, but significantly, uh, there's been a significant pickup in the last round. Okay, so let me uh, uh, 
now turn to to the, the related uh, uh, question of uh, the, the reinforcement provided by improving labour market prospects. So since labour costs constitute the dominant share of domestic costs, it is difficult to sustain inflation at the target 2% level if, if the labour market is too weak. So here in chart eight, what I show is the evolution of unemployment since 2014. Uh, and uh, what you see here is that first of all, uh, compared to uh, that range 2014 to 2019, uh, which of course uh, over time, uh, uh, the inflation, the unemployment numbers come down quite a bit. But if you like the prospects for, for inflation dynamics, where, when the unemployment rate you know, is around seven, should be different uh, compared to this earlier uh, period uh, when unemployment on average was much higher. Now, of course, at the start of the pandemic, unemployment went up. Um, but again, what we're seeing in, in the forward-looking projection is a vision where unemployment is going to continue to decline to the mid-sixes. And again, this has not been seen in the year area for 40 years. Uh, let me also emphasize in terms of uh, the updating of beliefs about unemployment uh, to look at the next slide, chart nine. Uh, and what I show here is the, the blue line is essentially the vision from before the pandemic into December 2019 uh, uh, projections, which had basically a gradual but limited uh, improvement in the unemployment situation from mid sevens to low sevens uh, over the projection horizon. And that was in line with a gradual but limited improvement in inflation uh, uh, over oh, in the December 2019 projections. Then uh, the uh, orange line is from June 2020, when it, the first full uh, projection after pandemic, when, when the, you know, the projection was quite pessimistic about the unemployment, uh, which was projected to go as high over, to around 10% and to remain uh, you know, above nine uh, through 2022. So what we've seen since then is, is and of course, going back, thanks to the huge uh, amount of fiscal support, especially, is by September, uh, the, the, there's a huge, uh, huge improvement in the unemployment uh, prospects, but still well above the pre-pandemic pass. So not a full recovery compared to pre-pandemic. And then in December, there was a further uh, revision, which not only restored the pre-pandemic path, but went below it. So the labor market uh, prospects, you know, have moved uh, quite a bit over, over this period. Now, again, uh, uh, for simplicity, I'm just showing unemployment here, uh, but we, we always would look at a much wider set of indicators of labor market slack, uh, especially given uh, the remaining distortions uh, that, that uh, might mean that the measured unemployment rate is, is giving some degree of a false signal. Now, last week uh, in the blog post, I emphasized, you know, what, the, what we see in terms of uh, surveys about wage dynamics do suggest a tightening of, of the labour market. So you know, where is this coming from? Well, as I emphasised, um, it's the success of macro policies during the pandemic, with fiscal policy protecting household incomes, mitigating corporate vulnerabilities, and maintaining the link between firms and workers through wage subsidy schemes, and short-term working, and, and other uh, programmes. Of course, uh, it's important to look beyond specific uh, firm uh, worker linkages and think about the overall favorable aggregate demand conditions, uh, which have been supported by uh, favorable financing conditions and uh, macro relevant fiscal policies. Let me also, of course, emphasize is when we, we think the labor market is going to tighten, some of this reflects the aging of the year area population, especially in some countries and the possibilities that the labor supply contribution from foreign workers may be weaker compared to pre-pandemic trends. So while uh, these uh, adverse labor supply developments might tighten the labor market, they do have adverse implications for the trend path for potential output. So uh, what I've tried to do here is to say there's essentially two uh, inflation uh, narratives going on. One is understanding and decomposing the well above target inflation rate we have right now, 
Uh, but it remains the case that, you know, all the analysis and all the surveys suggest uh, this will largely uh, uh, dissipate um, uh, and not, not, not uh, uh, be sustained. But I'm also emphasizing here today that there are some uh, medium term uh, uh, persistent dynamics uh, which can be connected to the revision in inflation expectations. And of course, uh, th this only matters to the extent those inflation expectations influence price and weight setting behavior uh, and convert into actual hard data. Um, and then second, the tighter labor market does create an environment in, in which uh, it's more likely to have self-sustaining inflation. So uh, when we think about monetary policy, uh, we, we have to take into account the near-term and the medium-term forces shaping the inflation dynamics. So in line with our strategy, it should be clear, we will set our monetary policy to deliver our symmetric 2% target over the medium term. And we would not tolerate either an overreaction, but nor an underreaction to emerging inflation risks. So in particular, if the medium term inflation dynamic is anticipated to stabilize around 2%, this will permit a gradual normalization of monetary policy. If uh, it tr inflation threatens to persist significantly above 2% in the medium term, a tightening of monetary policy would be required. And of course, if inflation is anticipated to fall significantly below the 2% target of the medium term, setting a sufficiently accommodative monetary policy would be necessary. Uh, so with that, uh, let, let me uh, stop on these opening remarks and I'm happy to see what uh, questions uh, and comments people have. Thank you very much, Philip, for a very helpful overview of inflation dynamics. Um, I'll kick things off with a couple of questions, if I may, and then we have lots of questions coming in from participants, so I'm very happy to um, open the floor to those. My first question was um, related to what you've just been talking about very closely, um, also the outcome of the last um, governing council meeting. I wonder whether you think markets rather got ahead of themselves in their response to the February monetary policy decision, or rather in response to the press conference, perhaps, by pricing in two rate hikes this year? Um, or was that perhaps the desired effect? So, I mean, there's always a classic hall of mirrors issue, you know, think about the interaction between uh, market behavior and the economic policy. So let me give my fairly uh, straightforward view on this. You know, we have, uh, when we conduct all the analysis we conduct for every meeting, uh, which incorporates uh, all the data we see in front of us, then uh, when we uh, uh, write the monetary policy statement, when we make policy deci decisions, uh, we, we have to give our, our kind of uh, straightforward assessment of what we see. And uh, what we, in the, for, for me, the, the, the key communication uh, coming out of that meeting is compared to our, de uh, our December expectations. So compared to what our view of the world uh, at the December meeting, that there were upside risks to the inflation outlook, particularly in the near term. And that's just a simple reflection of um, the fact that, you know, we saw this uh, further increases in energy prices. Uh, we, we saw the December and the January inflation numbers. Um, and it was and also, uh, you know, the, the fact that the survey professional forecasters, uh, the uh, corporate telephone survey, the unemployment numbers were basically confirming, if you like, that uh, the the uh, medium these medium term fundamentals were improving, and then another very significant issue which we highlighted in, in the monetary policy statement is in December mid December Omicron what was a real unknown unknown we didn't know uh, but it was definitely a risk factor whereas you know we emphasised in, in the uh, February statement that uh, you know. The pandemics, you know, this wave of the pandemic seems to be having a smaller impact. Um, and in fact, you know, fundamentally, we did think uh, Europe would see a uh, good recovery. So, you know, in terms of uh, what the market has, you know, has to think about, it is, you know, uh, there's a lot going on in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would emphasize is that for us, 
and you know, I'm trying to also communicate it today, is we have a, a very stable strategy. It was unanimously agreed last summer. We have a very stable reaction function. Uh, there were, and uh, we, uh, I think, uh, uh, are just reading the data uh, as we see it. But th there is no uh, change in our strategy. There's no change in our reaction function. It's essentially the data are coming in. And, uh, you know, we, we felt we had to communicate uh, the fact that there is a, uh, it'd be obtuse, honestly, it'd be obtuse, uh, even though it's not a projection meeting, uh, to, to not comment on the fact that there were, was a move in the data compared to our, our December assessment. Sure. I know that one of the factors the Governing Council is watching very closely is wage growth. Um, and indeed, there are signs of pickup across the euro area. But I wonder whether, given its status as a lagging indicator, do you think it's necessary for the ECB to act before wage growth actually shows up? Or can you afford to wait and see how strong it really is before doing so? So, so again, when, when we think about, first, first of all, let me emphasize, it is already in December, uh, we'd uh, already moved, we'd embarked, we decided to end the net purchase phase of the PEP, you know, uh, this month or next month at the end of March. Uh, we decided in terms of the overall pace fast of purchases that our vision for 2022 would be a lot less purchasing than done in, in 21. So there's already a movement in our kind of monetary uh, assessment. And of course, that was backed up by the fact that the December forecast was already a significant improvement in terms of the medium term in inflation as, as it compared to uh, uh, compared to, to September. But the, as you know, uh, all, all of the projections we have are based on essentially prevailing financial conditions. Uh, and of, so, you know, on that basis, when what I've been trying to emphasize is um, what we're seeing is is that uh, there's a you know as I showed you with the survey monitor analysts for example there's a significant fraction out there who still think inflation may settle well below two there's a significant fraction who think inflation will settle more or less at two percent um, and so uh, when you think about you know what is the monetary policy path going from a, a vision where inflation will, will settle, you know, uh, below 2%, but maybe not too far below 2% versus at the target. It, it does have monetary policy implications, but, but it's not uh, gigantic compared to a situation where you assess that inflation is going to settle well above 2%, and therefore you need to have uh, monetary policy actions that are actually trying to... Uh, slow down the economy, to, to raise uh, financing costs, to slow down the economy. I mean, that's, I don't think it is uh, essentially what we see in front of us. What we Because the current inflation rate is mostly an imported inflation shock. Um, it's not the case uh, that there's um, uh, a kind of domestic demand uh, boom uh, overheating the European economy. So in terms of urgency, uh, I think gradualism, uh, uh, makes sense in this scenario where we don't have that uh, the anchoring to the upside uh, situation. But what's also true is in terms of the pathway for the economy. I mean, if inflation is expected to settle around two, and if you have this uh, period of above two inflation for a while, uh, the you know the uh, interest rate path, uh, the the path for asset purchases. Uh, we'll have to take that into account. It's a different path compared to a pathway where you think you have an open-ended, indefinite, below two situation, which is what, what we did have. Um, so, so there are implications of, of uh, if it turns out uh, that inflation is projected to settle around two, uh, it's a different monetary policy, but equally, it's also not a monetary policy that, that requires uh, a kind of a significant uh, uh, tightening cycle. Sure. I have a, a question from a, a client, Philip. Um, they ask, in your conclusion, you say that if the medium term inflation dynamic is anticipated to stabilize at around two, the 2% target, 
This will, this will permit a gradual normalization of monetary policy. The charts you present suggest that conviction that medium term inflation will stabilize around 2% should have risen. Are you therefore saying the time has come for gradual normalization of monetary policy? So uh, here I'm going to be uh, data dependent. Um, what, and you know, honestly, I mean, uh, a lot of time, uh, both internally into your system and externally, it's, a, it's a, you know, I do have the observation is, is that we need to think about uh, probability distributions. I'm not going to claim I know the precise answer about what the future is going to bring. Uh, I know that the year system staff wouldn't claim that, I, but I also know uh, any independent external expert is not going to claim that. So, you know, the, the, uh, there will always be a judgment call uh, about the balance of risks. Um, but what's also true, I mean, I, and I think uh, it's pretty robust, uh, it, it is that there is a difference between um, a scenario where inflation is projected to settle basically around 2% versus significantly uh, below 2%. But it's not, you know, an earth-shaking, gigantic difference. But of course, uh, if you were, you know, if so, inflation was so sticky below 2 for so long pre-pandemic, e even the fact that this is essentially... Uh, if you like, uh, uh, delivering what we want. We do, we have a, a lot of uh, uh, deep research, a lot of uh, reflection about what do we want. And, you know, I think the evidence we gathered and looked at is overwhelming. We want a 2% uh, medium-term inflation uh, trend. And uh, of course, for those of you who've seen the 18 uh, discussion papers by the year system staff, which were, was the kind of, intellectual uh, in ingredients into the strategy, you can read uh, the very strong case for wanting that 2% uh, medium term inflation uh, trend. So uh, the transition uh, from, from and let me recall again in terms of the actual data, from 2014 to 2019 pre-pandemic, inflation was basically around one, 0 0.9. Moving from around one to around two, in terms of the kind of uh, average inflation rate, uh, it is, uh, is a significant uh, in itself. And uh, what I've been saying is we've already been adjusting our policy. Um, um, by the way, going back to December 2020, which is basically uh, the point uh, where, where the yield curve has reached its lowest value going into December 2020 meeting, since then, there, there has been a significant move up in, in for example, the long end of the yield curve. But basically, uh, that's been, uh, at the same time, we've seen the improvement in inflation expectations. We've seen the strong recovery. We've seen the reduction in pandemic uncertainty. So uh, there's already been a, you know, a move in financial conditions, um, uh, which, and that's basically our, our task, is to make sure uh, financing conditions uh, are, are basically calibrated uh, to deliver the 2% target. Uh, and where exactly the level of those financing conditions should be uh, will differ according to uh, um, w whether we're more or less at two versus significantly below. Sure. Thank you. Another um, client has messages to ask about our staff. Um, they say in the US, markets are aware of what the FOMC considers to be the longer run expectation for the Fed run fund rate uh, in a range of 2 to 3 percent, with a central tendency at 2.3 to 2.5 percent. Clearly, the Governing Council doesn't publish a dot plot like this. However, ECB board members have occasionally published a chart showing a range of estimates for R star. Would you be willing to share with us today your perspectives on where you see R star in the euro area? How much emphasis do you personally place on our style when formulating policy? So, I mean, this is a, obviously a very interesting issue, and I'm pretty sure uh, some of my own uh, speeches have uh, incorporated charts showing uh, uh, the very good year system work on, on the factors uh, and estimating our star for the year area. Uh, I mean, obviously, one basic issue there is is our star varies over time. Uh, and there is also a significant uncertainty range around this. Um, this is, of course, uh, 
you know, when you're in, in a zone where the interest rate is your active policy instrument, then uh, this issue, um, when, you know, uh, when you're in that zone, uh, this would be super important uh, to think about, you know, what, what is the underlying steady state uh, real rate, the underlying steady state nominal rate. Uh, but that, that is not uh, for today. You know, uh, what we're talking about, you know, uh, our policies in December, we're essentially uh, saying that uh, we have a sequence uh, that we, we laid out a kind of a vision for asset purchasing. We emphasized that uh, interest rates would not be lifted until uh, after we ended uh, asset, net asset purchasing. Uh, and so the, the time uh, horizon under which uh, we would have to uh, think a lot more about uh, where exactly is our star uh, is not now. It's, you know, when we are in that zone, when the interest rate is the marginal uh, tool, and uh, that is not today's situation. So no doubt uh, uh, we will have to uh, have a lot more conversations about this um, uh, when we get to that uh, zone uh, in the future. Given that you're starting from uh, negative policy rates, which have been an effective, I think, but perhaps a diminishing uh, tool in terms of utility. Do you distinguish between hikes back to zero and hikes above zero, or do you see the hurdle for all hikes being equal, as it were? So I think uh, we will be uh, scientific about this. Uh, we've published a lot, and I have also written quite a bit about uh, the role of negative interest rate policy. Uh, let me emphasize also the fact that there's a Lots of uh, complementarities, nonlinearities, interaction effects between negative interest rates uh, with uh, with the asset purchasing um, with, with the teltros. So, uh, whatever uh, future interest rate decisions will take a, into account all of that. All, all I can say is, is uh, uh, there's, there's a, a multiple uh, factors uh, to think about. Uh, negative interest rates are different. But I, I would not agree with your characterization that that essentially there's necessarily a diminishment over time in their effectiveness. So, for example, let me give you a very basic uh, fa fact here it is the fraction because the typical, uh, uh, you know, uh, story people would give, well, because you can't uh, bring deposit rates below zero, you, you have this basic asymmetry where uh, the deposit rates don't go negative. Um, um, but by comp competitive forces, uh, lending rates uh, go down. But what we've seen in recent years is more and more uh, corporate deposits, and actually uh, above at least a certain threshold, more and more household deposits are paying the negative rate. So in, in that sense, the negative rate policy uh, has maybe, uh, uh, you know, has been more effective now than in the past. And we also, with the tiering decision in, you know, uh, in 2019, did, did uh, take into account the implications for the banking system of holding uh, uh, excess liquidity remunerated at a negative deposit rate. So uh, you know, at any point in time, when it's relevant for the decision about uh, whether to raise or not, uh, we will, uh, as you might expect, be doing a full analysis of, of, of uh, um, uh, all of those dimensions. So again, it's not a simple uh, answer. Uh, do I say, do I think they're different? Yes, I do. Uh, do I think all of the points of difference are in one direction? No, I don't. Thank you, thank you. Um, so we've had a question about APP. Um, the client has asked, in December 2021, the ECB announced that APP will be extended until October 2022. Uh, from the February press conference and rhetoric thereafter, risks are biased um, towards an end of APP in Q3 to be announced perhaps in March. What's the risk of a faster tapering of APP by the end of June? I, I'm sure, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, obviously, uh, I'm not going to front run any, any future decisions, but let me go back to, to what I said earlier on. It is that... Um, if you like the, the kind of um, uh, if you map the expected you know medium term inflation and you map that to financing conditions 
Uh, the difference between having inflation where it was in the December projection versus having inflation um, more or less at target, uh, there is a difference. But then you have to say, okay, exactly how much of a difference? And what does that mean for, for the correct timeline for, for the uh, asset purchases? And what it means for the interest rate path after that? Uh, and I will let uh, your questioner and everyone else work out their own version, as of course many people do day by day, their own version of, of what might be needed. Um, but again, to repeat, in, in my uh, own uh, personal point of view, and again, I think it's also seen in all of the surveys, is that's really what we're talking about, is um, of the three possible regimes, are we, uh, you know, moving from essentially having to combat persistently well below target inflation to essentially uh, delivering uh, the financing conditions needed to stabilize inflation more or less at target. That's really, to me, is the, is the big uh, uh, debate. Uh, do we think we have a situation where uh, the, the above target inflation is going to persist uh, such that an actual tightening cycle is needed. Um, I, I think uh, that that's not something um, I personally see in the data, at least as of now. Sure. We, we've had a few questions, Peter, on, uh, sorry, um, Philip, on the, uh, the subject of owner-occupied housing and its inclusion in inflation measures. Um, I saw just the other day the ECB published a very interesting uh, paper on just this issue, um, suggesting that owner-occupied housing um, added around 0.6% to core inflation at the end of last year, uh, and around 0.3% per year on average in the 10 years before that. I wonder how close you think the full incorporation of owner-occupied housing into the ECB's inflation measures is. Um, and relatedly, had that process already take, had taken place, would you perhaps be discussing policy uh, slightly differently at this juncture? Well, I, I'm not so sure uh, um, the huge amount of value to, to addressing that particular hypothetical. So, so let's go over, and again, this is a very important part of our strategy review. Uh, I actually personally do think um, owner-occupied housing costs were are underweighted in the price index. I mean, anyone, uh, you know, many people on the call uh, uh, either owns a home or may know someone who owns a home, and it's costly. It's you know, it's a big part a part of the uh, overall living costs. It is all of the costs associated with owning a home. That includes the acquisition of a home, you know, but let me emphasize, and again, the article you mentioned in the bulletin, I think it goes through a lot of, a, a, you know, explanatory detail of, of the, the concept. Um, but there's a lot of running costs. If you try to do a renovation, uh, repairs, there's all sorts of uh, costs of owning a home, um, which basically, to me, are broadly uh, analytically going to be similar to raising the share of services in the, in the price index. Because these are often uh, labor costs, you know, the cost of uh, construct, you know, having skilled uh, uh, construction workers uh, um, working uh, either on new build homes or, or renovations. Uh, of course, there's also the, uh, you know, we also know uh, construction renovations use a lot of uh, materials. A lot of these are very much affected by the uh, energy shock and, and global commodities. So uh, we have a clear vision of where we're going to end up, where we do have a, a price index which incorporates uh, um, this property. And uh, what we also said in, is in the meantime, we, we will take into account uh, what's available to us. Uh, now, um, as you indicated, um, uh, you know, the, the index we have, which comes out with a significant lag. So we know about Q321. Um, so the question is, descriptively, yes, we know that this measure would show uh, more inflation uh, at that point. Um, but it, it's a more difficult question to know, okay, uh, in terms of the forward-looking inflation horizon, uh, how much would it move the forward-looking component, the inflation projection? Um, uh, 
and for example, uh, some of those components will probably be much more cyclical in both directions. So you can have periods like we've just gone through where it leads to, to more inflation. There could be periods where it leads to a sharper drop in inflation. Uh, and so uh, where we ended up was being clear, when we talk about 2%, we're targeting the HICP, the existing HICP. Um, but, you know, we look at a lot of other measures. We, everyone knows we look at, you know, we look at uh, underlying inflation measures. We always look at the GDP deflator. We absolutely look at the owner-occupied housing index. And we've done that on a systematic basis, especially since, since the review. And maybe for me, uh, for now, a very bottom line issue is, is what is the signal coming from the, this other measure? So I've given you the caveat, it's coming with a lag. Uh, I've given you a caveat that it's, you know, the kind of uh, uh, forecasting of that uh, might be uh, uh, trickier than, than the forecasting of some other components. But, you know, in the end, uh, we will uh, forecast it. Um, but, you know, the, the difficult situation is if we're sending a conflicting signal to, to the kind of conventional HICP measure. Whereas if we have a scenario where essentially both are sending the same signal directionally, uh, you know, I do think uh, th th that's useful information. Sure. I have a, another audience uh, question, this time um, concerning financing conditions. Um, you mentioned that there's been a sig significant move up in the long end of the yield curve. Um, and uh, the ECB's task is to ensure financing conditions are calibrated to achieve your 2% symmetric target. Are you, the client suggests, um, uh, suggesting that the recent rise in uh, financial conditions in terms of higher forward interest rates is broadly appropriate given the rise in inflation expectations, especially if we think about financial conditions in real terms? Again, I... I not sympathetic to, to partial equilibrium analyses of, of the where financing conditions should be, uh, especially shorthand uh, back at, you know calculations where people all you think all you need to look at is okay, here's where the nominal yield curve is or lending rates, whatever uh, component of finance conditions, and here is some measure of expected inflation, and that's it. We do a full general equilibrium macro assessment. And we based our monetary policy decisions about where we essentially uh, think the, the uh, yield curve should be based on that. So I, I think it, it's, it's, um, it's not the way I think about it. I say, look, you know, um, uh, we have to put all of that into general equilibrium. Uh, and that's why, you know, uh, the kind of projections we receive from the staff are so important, which do put um uh movements in, in finance conditions into that general equilibrium perspective and uh, as i say uh I, I i really don't think you can uh, boil down uh, uh the monetary policy um uh, challenge just to some kind of a uh, strip down uh, real interest rates uh, target another client asked so this is uh time relating to um interest rates when the ECB took the deposit rate below zero, policy rate changes were in 10 basis point increments, in part due to uncertainty around the transmission and side effects. Is the same caution therefore likely to be appropriate should the policy rate rise? So the, the way I, I would say, I mean, I've already basically given you the answer <laughs> is that uh, when we have to think about an interest rate decision, we're going to look at all factors. And when you are in negative territory, um, uh, these factors will be in terms of the pros and cons of the exact size of the increment. It's not obvious. Um, there's no simple answer to that. But what, let me go back to the basic point is, uh, the it's, I mean, you know, I suppose this is universal. The uh, size and, you know, frequency of interest rate moves depend on essentially the kind of regime you think you're in. Is it the case that this is essentially a gradual normalization situation? Or is it the case you need to have a kind of a significant tightening of financing conditions in order to slow down the economy and basically disinflate the economy back towards target? 
And uh, that they're very different uh, kind of visions in terms of the, the scale and the speed of, of uh, uh, interest rate uh, pathway. So um, th there's no kind of, a, I think, a simple answer on that. Uh, what we will do is, I think, uh, will be in line with what we think is, is a good idea, as opposed to having a me any mechanical. I mean, it's a, by the way, but on reflection, it does raise an interesting uh, global point about, you know, uh, uh, where the, this kind of default of 25 basis points uh, came from. I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that it's a, it's a bad increment to think about, but the, there are other increments possible as well. Sure. If I could turn back briefly to the issue of APP, I understand that the Governing Council has discussed, and I think it was referenced in a, um, a speech by one of your central bank colleagues uh, it was a couple of days ago, um, changing the forward guidance to remove the reference to ending APP shortly before raising rates. I wonder how close are we to agreeing that change? Um, does, end, does ending APP commit you to raising rates within a given time frame, in your view? Um, could we see a much longer interview, interval between the end of APP and the first rate hike than perhaps markets are pricing in? So again, I'm not going to really uh, comment uh, on future policy decisions. Um, but of course, every central bank is going to be data dependent. And let me give you the example of the last time we ended net purchases under the APP. It, it, is that um, uh, there was a guidance about the fact that we're going to end APP. And by the way, we're not going to think about raising rates until uh, through the summer uh, 19, if I recollect. Um, but then it turned out that the world changed. The world changed. There was a slowdown in the inflation dynamic. And in the end, uh, we, we went back to restarting the APP in September 19. Um, so the idea that at any point in time, uh, we can lock ourselves in uh, into, into not only the uh, immediate decision we face at any meeting, but also uh, lock into some uh, future, uh, in, the, in the distant future sequence of, of other decisions, I don't think any central bank is going to sign up to that. Um, so the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 in the sequence, uh, the first decision, uh, when it's appropriate to do so, is to think about revising the guidance on, on the, uh, on the uh, APP. And uh, the, then uh, the implications of that, uh, we don't live in a world of certainty. Uh, and so, I don't, you know, we will have to take into account that uncertainty uh, in, in uh, any future policy decision. Would you yourself be in favour of adjusting the pace of, e of APP at each? Again, I'm not going to uh, front run uh, future policy decisions. <laughs> okay, to ask a, put it another way, could you, or could the Governing Council, in your view, announce the end of APP and indicate a rise in interest rates is coming at the same meeting? I mean, I, I don't think I can engage with that hypothetical. Uh, but I'll just go back to what I just said. Uh, you know, you make a, you know, the decision you make is the decision you make uh, at a point in time. Uh, and then the data is going to move. And then the data is going to move. Uh, and then uh, at the next point in time, if the data have moved, then that will be part of uh, what you need to take into account in a decision. Do you see a role or what role do you expect Teltro's to play in helping to preserve monetary policy transmission during the transmission to normal policy? So again, uh, this is something that we always look at. Uh, you know, I think Teltro's have been a very important and are currently a very important tool. Um, but uh, their appropriate role uh, does depend on the wider assessment of where do we think financing conditions should be. Um, and, and that's because the current Teltro program is running. Uh, it, it's honestly, it's not an immediate issue. It is that uh, this is something uh, that we will always look at, um, but it, it's, it's, you know, not the marginal instrument at the moment. 
Philip, we heard a, a question come in from uh, an audience member about the exchange rate, um, which I know the ECB doesn't target. Um, uh, they ask, uh, you or governing council members generally often say the euro is only discussed as it impacts monetary policy. How big a factor is that now, given record high factory gate inflation across the euro area? Okay, that's an interesting question uh, because uh, quite often I, I do get a sensation from some people that they take a mechanical view, that we think about the exchange rate simply as a way to convert foreign currency prices into domestic currency prices. Now, of course, that's one mechanism. Uh, but again, let me make a point it is that uh, in the full macro assessment, uh, the exchange rate matters through all sorts of channels. Uh, you know, Europe has a lot of multinational firms who sell across the world. And, and the, the value of their earnings, you know, uh, and in turn, the, their kind of competitiveness of European firms uh, will depend on the, ex on the exchange rate. And that's independent of, of this issue of converting import prices in, into uh, euro prices. Um, and so uh, the exchange rate certainly uh, has an influence on, uh, on uh, all the big macro factors, including investment. And in turn, by affecting uh, the macro dynamic, it will have an effect on the inflation dynamic as well. So it, it's a pretty broad issue, uh, which is much more general than, than the uh, question of you know, how big and how quick is the pass through to import prices. Um, let me also emphasize uh, for those of you who, because I sometimes hear this, it is, you know, obviously lots of commodities, including oil, are quoted in dollars. But that doesn't mean the way to think about the price of oil is uh, let's have a model dollar price and then multiply by the exchange rate and that's the euro price. Because uh, the dollar price affects global factors, including uh, European factors. And so it's, it's not a kind of, a, we're not a small open economy. Um, and uh, we, we have to take, a, as I say, a fully integrated view of the role of exchange rate movements. Now, what I have said, uh, I think, uh, you know, in, in uh, recent weeks in some interview probably, is what we essentially have now is uh, we, we had a euro appreciation in the first year of the pandemic. Um, a fair chunk of that has rolled back uh, more recently. Um, so in terms of if you think about pre-pandemic versus now, uh, there's not a huge movement, to, but there has been. So if you like, when you, th when you think about the different time lags of how the exchange rate affects the economy, um, you know, the, the rolling back of the appreciation takes away one disinflationary force uh, that was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a part of the uh, dynamic in, in 2020. Thank you. Um, I have another question from an, uh, an audience member here. Would you say that there's a limit to how high European country spreads could go without severely impeding the monetary policy, trans uh, policy transmission mechanism? What is the potential of the ECB to intervene in a case with soaring country spreads, but with above level inflation? Let me make uh, several points about this. So first of all, um, you know, I, I think I'm coming back to one basic point all the time is, you know, everything has been the context of the overall macro assessment. So, you know, if, if there's no kind of, uh, 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 you know, unique, uh, uh, number that, that kind of doesn't vary over time in, in terms of where interest rates uh, should be. What we did say, and I think it's very important, it is in December when we did say we're going to end the net purchases under the APP, it is that we did uh, want to be clear that, you know, flexibility in monetary policy will apply in the future um, as appropriate, you know, especially under stress conditions. And we said, you know, and we gave a particular example of that. We said, well, for example, the reinvestment uh, of, the, of the very large PEP portfolio uh, uh, it could be one uh, mechanism by which such flexibility would be used. So I, I think it's very important. And look at the track record of the ECB. Uh, it, it's very important to, to say that we absolutely are committed to making sure that we, we have a stable transmission mechanism. Uh, at the European Parliament this week, the president, you know, I think in answer to a question, again, emphasized that, you know, we do think it's perfectly possible to combine uh, monetary tightening if needed 
with maintaining a stable uh, transmission mechanism. Uh, so so uh, this is absolutely um, uh, uh, some, something that, that, that we are very focused on. And I've always been super clear. Uh, I do think that the transmission me mechanism um, uh, does benefit from, from you know, the ECB um, making sure that that you know, unwarranted uh, liquidity concerns, if you like, or unwarranted speculation cannot be allowed to disrupt the transmission mechanism. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from the chat room, Philip. Uh, this time, the audience member asks, the Consumer Inflation Expectations Survey median expectation over three years appears to be suspiciously stable at 2%. Could this be a function of how the series is cleaned by removal of the tails? Separately, when will this, this CIE be published by the ECB as a statistical series? Um, so I think we've, we've um, so I, I don't know the answer to the second one. No, I don't think it's cleaning. Uh, well, I mean, maybe there's some cleaning, uh, to be honest, I'm not so sure about that. But I mean, the graph does show, we do, I mean, if, if you can, Go back to that slide on on the uh, slideshow. It might be uh, helpful. So we do show the average as well. So, you know, so on, on chart five, um, I mean, you don't need to, to show it. I mean, people can go to the. ECB websites they want to look. I mean, I'm showing the median, but I'm also showing the average, which of course is is uh, well above the median, because we know. I mean, the world knows. Every survey does show a lot of dispersion at the household level. Uh, that the typical person does uh, report inflation, uh, you know, much higher than than the actual number. Um, but it, it remains the case, as I say, the. Uh, even if you allow for that, I mean, if, if, we, if you look at the averages here rather than the medians, uh, the increase in the near term is larger than the increase in, in the, uh, it's chart five. Um, uh, so let, let's take the average to, to uh, you know, which brings in all of the observations. Um, uh, you can see there in terms of the one year ahead, the, the average um, um, you know it, it has moved up and, and it's you know there I'm just eyeballing it now so it may not be perfectly accurate but it's it's you know let's say it's ballpark five percent the one year ahead but the one year ahead um, uh, Average for, for the red is is no, it's four, but it's well below the near term. So, so the point still holds qualitatively that is the idea that what we're learning from the consumer expectation survey is that there's a stronger increase in the near term compared to the longer term in terms of beliefs about inflation. So, i.e., they don't think it's going to be uh, you know permanently at the current level. Um, so. Uh, but the median, you know, is straight out of the, the survey. And of course, I don't know where, where the questioner is coming from, but of course there are very significant uh, country differences. I mean, there's all sorts of interesting ways to, to organize these data. I think the ECB has published some uh, explanation, but I'm sure more, more will be done. Thank you very much. Philip, a topic that's very much on everybody's mind at the moment is Ukraine. Um, and it's been estimated that a Russian invasion of Ukraine, if met with um, EU and US sanctions, could add two percentage points to inflation in Europe. Um, would that warrant tightening action from the ECB in your view? Or do you look through it in the interest of protecting growth and instead perhaps pin your hopes on uh, fiscal authorities stepping in to mitigate the effects of rising energy uh, commodity prices? Um, and a related question, um, if an invasion were to play, take place, how would the EC, ECB support CEE economies? So, so I mean, in, in the opening remarks today, and I'll, I'll let uh, uh, the questioner to read, um, 
I, I did a fairly long section in the openings about how do we think about energy prices um, and, and the impact. And I mentioned there, you know, four factors you've mentioned, and not you know uh, the direct impact. Uh, I'm not. I don't particularly recall the, that exact calculation you, you report there. Um, then you have the indirect impact through two other components. Uh, then you have maybe the second hand effects, but then you have the macro effect. So then we, we have to think about the macro effect if there were such a kind of event, you know, because of course it's not just going to be confined uh, to, to mechanical energy price effect. There will be a response uh, which will vary across the area in terms of uh, um, exposures to, to, to Ukraine, exposures to Russia. Um, so, of course, we, we would look at all of that in, in a comprehensive, comprehensive way. Um, and the, um, you know, I've given you the, 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 the menu of what we would look at in terms of duration, size, uh, what's driving it, um, what's the macro implications. So, so, you know, I don't think uh, there'd be any mechanical uh, response to that. Um, and... Uh, you know, I, th I think the ECB uh, will al always, uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't think I have a direct comment about the implications of the Ukraine, but let, let me go back to, to the, what, what we did in the pandemic. And just as a reminder that that through uh, uh, swaps and repos, we did provide significant support um, uh, for, for various uh, neighboring countries. Um, so in, in a very general sense, uh, we very much recognise our regional role, um, uh, but I'm not, I'm not saying that there's any particular uh, reason to believe the Ukraine situation would have that kind of spillover on, on the region. Sure, thank you. If I could um, look beyond the Euro area briefly, I wonder if you could um, tell us what might be the policy implications of faster Fed tightening, tightening for the ECB. Are there advantages as the ECD, ECB sees in being behind the Fed in the sense that you can learn what works and what doesn't in the normalization playbook? Well, again, I mean, I think there are several levels uh, to this. Uh, maybe the uh, most important uh, point, with, which you know, I, I was making last year as well, when there was also a spillovers from the US in early 2021, is in the end that uh, the ECB, uh, uh, we're not a small open economy, we're not a dollarized economy, and so uh, we will uh, respond, uh, we will be able to kind of uh, uh, adjust, uh, you know, with our monetary policy in, in uh, either direction to, to the net impact of, of uh, global financing conditions uh, or monetary policy elsewhere. I mean, there's clearly possible effects on the long end of the yield curve, even if we have a pretty much direct control of the short end. The long end, uh, you know, obviously global investors uh, can will will decide uh, between yields in dollars versus yields in euro uh, in portfolio decisions. There's the exchange rate impact, as we talked about. Um, so, so we we would have to think about okay, what's the net impact on the financing conditions of the euro area? And in turn, uh, what, what does that imply for the inflation dynamic and what does that imply for our own policy? So, you know, the uh, spillovers um, and also, by the way, the, the, the kind of a, a indirect mechanism, because, of course, a lot of the world is dollarized. A lot of the world uh, will be sensitive to, to the um, uh, monetary policy or more generally finance conditions in, in, uh, in the dollar uh, system uh, and we will integrate that. So we would always be fully integrating uh, uh, the, the, these uh, issues. Um, so, yeah, so, so I think it, it's, it's definitely something that we would uh, also spend a lot of time looking at. I mean, honestly, I mean, the issue about, well, you go first or sequencing, I don't think so. I mean, we, we the uh, the calendar of meetings and so on is uh, uh, obviously the market uh, tries to foresee uh, your area of finance conditions are, are influenced by, by what's going on in, in the dollar system. Uh, and in that sense, it directly affects, you know, what, what's in front of us. Um, but, but I don't think going beyond that, uh, um, 
uh, is overly uh, um, first order in importance. Do you think central banks have the appropriate tools to tackle su supply side driven inflation? And if these, if these tools do exist, um, the value, global value, global supply chains, can any one central bank acting locally have meaningful impact? So again, you know, we, throughout the history of ECB, I mean, I think throughout the history of central banking, there's a very sharp distinction between uh, supply shocks and demand shocks. Um, and, you know, by and large, uh, and again, in, in my opening remarks today, it's basically reflected, uh, supply shocks uh, uh, tend to have a level effect in the price level. Uh, they, they tend to be temporary in nature. Um, and so uh, with one uh, key issue uh, uh, aside, uh, it essentially does not uh, call for monetary policy response. But that key issue is key, which is, does it lead to a uh, self-feeding dynamic of second round effects, the anchored inflation expectations? And that's where monetary policy would have to respond. And we know from the 1970s, as one clear example, is what might have been a supply shock ended up being a serious inflation shock in the end, in terms of a, a, a major uh, multi-year policy problem. So we do not ignore this issue, absolutely not. But, but the, it's not about saying that we can uh, uh, undo uh, these supply problems. Um, so part of this, and this is very important for the ECB, it's always been part of the ECB philosophy. Uh, if you go back to the late 90s, if you read uh, Otmar Issing's book about the birth of the euro, um, if you uh, look at any history of the euro, uh, but by the way, very robustly we confirmed in our unanimously agreed uh, strategy uh, last summer, is we take a medium-term perspective. And so we will uh, look through elements which are assessed to be more near-term in nature which will fade straight away. I mean, the way I expressed it last week is, uh, if you have a supply shock, which is you know, negative, uh, not just for, for the cost of living, but actually negative for, for the economic recovery more generally, uh, the answer, I don't think, lies in adding a domestic demand shock to that external supply shock. Um, so you know, I, I think it, it's very important that we maintain uh, the, the, this uh, distinction uh, to be clear uh, that monetary policy is not, cannot uh, fix the supply shock, but equally being clear, and this is one of the points I'm emphasizing today, is you know we, we're kind of uh, have a clear-eyed focus on the 2% medium-term inflation target, uh, that people should know uh, that you know uh, anything that puts that at risk and then in terms of looking at indicators, are, is there a risk of de-anchoring to the upside? Uh, is the wage behavior, which is, you know, tends to be quite persistent, uh, is that showing signs of de-anchoring to the upside? And uh, so long as uh, you know, we, we think uh, we, we don't have that, it's very important to emphasize monetary policy uh, will we'll be uh, focused on the medium term and will not overreact to near-term uh, excessive inflation. Let me emphasize in saying that, however, it's very important to emphasize, is that the, um, we take very seriously uh, that the, it's a significant hit to, to um, uh, people's living standards. And in turn, that's a significant hit uh, to the recovery. Uh, and it's full, so when I say that monetary policy is not going to uh, respond to it in a direct way. Uh, this, this I think, is, is extremely bad news for the European economy. Uh, it's, it's very bad news for living standards. Uh, it's, uh, it's very bad news for the earnings of, of uh, energy-using firms. Um, and so uh, this is, this is a, a very serious uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, issue. And of course, um, uh, the fact that it has a macro implications and distribution implications, because we also know lower income groups uh, have a much higher weight of energy in their consumption baskets and much less by way of savings buffers to absorb it. 
uh, there's also significant distribution issues. So of course, there's going to be a big fiscal reaction uh, to that. We're coming close to the end of our allotted time, I'm afraid. Um, we're very grateful to you, um, Philip, for speaking to us today. I just wondered, perhaps you've, you've already answered this, but I wondered if you had one single takeaway for markets today, what would it be? Well, I, mean, I did try and wrap it up at the uh, end of the opening remarks, which is, uh, to me, uh, for us, but you know, I presume also for, for market participants, uh, the, the big call to make is uh, what, what regime are we in? Are we in a regime where inflation is going to uh, return to significantly below the 2% target? Are we maybe rotating to a regime where inflation is going to settle more or less on target? Or are we in a regime where inflation is going to be, if you like, on an open-ended basis, uh, significantly above target? Because the monetary policy response to those three regimes are, are quite different. And of course, for those uh, market participants who need to think about uh, the future path of, of the yield curve and uh, financing conditions, that, that is the debate to have. And you know, in the euro area context, what I've tried to emphasize is, uh, and you see it in the surveys, uh, you know, let me just re-quote again the survey of monetary analysts. Basically, the fraction of analysts who think uh, we face a long-term above-target scenario is only about 10%. 90% uh, think either we're going to be more or less of target um, or uh, below target. And so in terms of uh, working out uh, likelihoods and the implications for monetary policy, you know, this is the way I think to organize us thinking on this topic. All uh, pleased to uh, disconnect, but once again, thank you very much, Philip Lane, Chief Economist of the ECB.